Hello, this podcast is about angular momentum. We're going to learn about the key concepts and relationships of angular momentum, as well as how to calculate it for rotating particles, rotating rigid bodies. We're also going to see how net torque affects the rate at which momentum changes. And lastly, we're going to study one of the most important laws of physics, and that's conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum is calculated relative to an arbitrary fixed point, which we call the origin. And it's the cross product of the position vector and the instantaneous linear momentum. Let's look at the sketch over here. We have our particle and its position relative to our origin. And the particle is moving along this line of motion with a mass m and the velocity vector. So this vector direction is also the direction of the momentum. So our angular momentum is the cross product of the position vector and the momentum vector. The magnitude of the angular momentum is the particle's mass times the magnitude of its velocity times the magnitude of its position times sine phi, where phi is once again this angle between the position vector and the velocity or momentum vector. And the direction of angular momentum is determined by the right-hand rule, and it will be perpendicular to the position momentum plane. And here we can just see a review of the right-hand rule. Align your four fingers of your right hand along the position vector, then curl your fingertips towards the momentum or velocity vector, and your thumb will be pointing in the direction of the angular momentum. In this case, to do this, we have to have our thumb pointing down. So if you think of the page or the sheet of paper as the plane that contains the momentum and position vectors, then angular momentum vector is pointing below or behind the page. Let's take a closer look at the angular momentum of a particle. So once again, we have our particle of mass m traveling in this direction, velocity v. Of course, that scalar product gives you the momentum vector, and here's our position vector. So the angular momentum is equal to m v r sine phi, but notice this r sine phi. We had this expression when we studied torque, and this was known as the lever arm, and it was the portion of the lever that was perpendicular to the force line of action. Well, this expression position times sine phi has a similar role in linear momentum in that this expression represents the portion of the position vector that is perpendicular not to the line of force but perpendicular to the line of motion. Here's an example of how we would calculate angular momentum for a particle. So let's assume this particle has a mass of 2 kilograms. It's 5 meters from the origin. It's moving at 3 meters per second and the angle phi is 30 degrees. To calculate the angular momentum, we plug those quantities into this equation, and we find that this particle has an angular momentum of 15 kilograms meters squared per second. Let's take a look at some key concepts of angular momentum. First, a particle does not have to rotate around the origin in order to have angular momentum. Any moving particle has angular momentum provided the line of motion doesn't pass through the origin. Because if it passes through the origin, then that expression r times sine phi is going to be equal to zero. Let's take a look at this visually. Here we have our particle on its line of motion, which passes through the origin. So notice that the position vector and the velocity vector are parallel to each other, an angle of 180 degrees, and of course the sine of 180 degrees is going to be equal to zero, so there's no angular momentum. The third key concept is if a particle moves with constant velocity, that's both magnitude and direction is constant. Its angular momentum will be constant because the expression vr sine phi is constant. Let's take a look at that visually. The particle is moving in a straight line. We showed it three different positions. The velocity vector is uniform in all three positions. Here's our origin. The position vector does change both in length and angle, but notice if we multiply the magnitude of this position vector times the sine of phi, this angle, it will give us a magnitude of this position vector. 
Here at this position, phi, of course, is 90 degrees, so this vector, the magnitude of this position vector times the sine of 90 degrees is going to be this length. And if we come to our third position, we see that we have a longer position vector. And if we look at this obtuse angle phi and take the sine of phi times the magnitude of this position vector, it once again will give us this length as the magnitude. So you can see that this term, velocity times position times the sine of phi, is going to be constant as long as this object continues in a straight line of motion. Let's look at a particle traveling in circular motion. And of course, uh, in circular motion, velocity is always perpendicular to the position vector. Therefore, this sine phi is going to turn out to be 1. Also, we can make the substitution that the velocity, the translational velocity, is equal to the angular velocity times radius. And when we do that, this gives us mass times angular velocity times r squared. But of course, mass times r squared is the expression for a particle's rotational inertia. So for a particle moving in circular motion or rotating, its angular velocity is going to be equal to its rotational inertia times its angular velocity. Notice this is very similar to the linear rotation the linear momentum, which is equal to mass times translational velocity. Furthermore, if velocity is constant, which we have when we have uniform circular motion, then the angular momentum does not change. Let's look at how we would calculate this. If this particle is once again 2 kilograms, and it's 5 meters from the origin, which happens to be the axis of rotation, and it's moving at 3 meters per second, then we can plug our numbers into the formula for angular momentum. Notice that the angle phi is 90 degrees, and we wind up with an angular momentum of 30 kilogram meter squared per second. Let's look at a system of rotating particles, and we'll look at the angular momentum of this system, and it's going to be equal to the sum of all the particles' angular momenta. So let's look at a situation where we have two masses that are connected to a thin rod of negligible mass, and it rotates around the center of the rod. The angular momentum of the system is simply going to be the sum of the two particles' angular momenta. And because phi is 90 degrees in this instance, we can simplify it even further to this expression. Let's calculate the angular momentum for a specific situation. We have two particles. In this case, they're equal in mass, 2, kilo, two kilograms each, and both are located 5 meters from the origin, which in this case is the axis of rotation. They are moving at 3 meters per second. So our angular momentum for this two-particle system would be 60 kilogram meters squared per second. Now, in this problem, the two objects, the two particles, had the same mass and they were the same distance from the origin. This does not have to be the case. They can be different masses and they can have different positions or distances from the origin. Let's move on and look at rotating rigid bodies. As with rotating particles, the angular momentum of rotating rigid bodies is also equal to the product of the rotational inertia and the angular velocity. So for a disk rotating about its center of mass, we would just take the expression for its rotational inertia and multiply it by its angular velocity. We would do the same thing for all the other shapes, just taking the expression for the ro rotational inertia and multiplying it by the angular velocity. Let's do some of these calculations. If in all these instances the mass of the rigid body is 2 kilograms, its distance from the origin, which would be the axis of rotation, is 5 meters, and its angular velocity is 3 radians per second, then we can look at the angular momentum. We just simply take these numbers and plug them into all of our expressions here for the different shapes, and we can see for the rotating disk, it's 75 kilogram meters squared per second, for the thin rod, it's 12.5 kilogram meters squared per second. For the rotating solid sphere, it's 60 kilogram meters squared per second. And finally, for the, for the rotating hollow sphere, it's 100 kilogram meters squared 
per second. Let's move on and talk about net torque and how it affects the rate of change of angular momentum. So the rate at which angular momentum changes is going to be equal to the external net torque acting on the particle, system of particles, or rigid body. And here's our expression. So the sum of all the external torques, that's just another name for net torque, is going to be equal to dl dt, the change in momentum with respect to time. Let's look at how we can use this relationship to analyze motion. A car wheel's angular momentum increased from 0 to 100 kilogram meters squared per second in 5 seconds. What was the net torque applied to the car wheel? We take our change in angular momentum and divide it by the amount of time it took for that change, and we find that the net torque was 20 newton meters. So note that this is similar to translational motion where the sum of the external forces, aka the net force, is equal to the rate at which linear momentum changes. So moving on, let's talk about the conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum is conserved unless a net external torque is applied to the particle, system of particles, or rigid body. This is one of the most important laws governing the motion of objects anywhere in the universe. This conservation law is similar to the one for linear momentum, which says that linear momentum is conserved in the absence of a net external force. So let's talk about what happens when we change rotational inertia in the absence of a net external torque. Well, the conservation law tells us that the total linear momentum is going to remain constant. So if the rotational inertia of an object increases, then it's got to rotate more slowly in order to maintain a constant angular momentum. And of course, the reverse is true. If the rotational inertia decreases, then the object will spin faster. One way to change the rotational inertia of an object is to increase or decrease its radius. Let's take a look at two practical examples involving the conservation of angular momentum. In our first example, we have a gymnast doing a somersault. Let's pretend it's the same gymnast in all three of these pictures. Notice the different positions. We know since it's the same gymnast, the mass is not going to change. But notice how the distance or radius from the axis of rotation is the smallest in the tucked position. It gets larger. The radius is larger in the what's known as the pike position, and then in the full layout position, the radius is the longest. So the rotational speed will be the quickest in the tucked position, and it'll be the slowest in the laid out position. And that's why gymnasts can do more somersaults in the tucked position than in the laid out position. Our second example involves ice skaters spinning. In this first picture on the left, we can notice that the mass is closely distributed to the axis of rotation. Here, in this one, the legs and arms get a little further away from the axis of rotation, so the distribution of mass is further away. And finally, on the far right, we can see that the torso and leg are fully extended, which distributes the mass as far away from the axis of rotation as possible. And of course, if you've ever watched ice skating, you'll see that in a single spin, the skater will change their body position. And as a result, they will either speed up or slow down their rate of rotation. Let's do some problem solving with conservation of angular momentum. We have a two kilogram ball attached to a two meter rope of negligible mass, and it rotates around the fixed point every half second. If the rope is shortened to half its original length, what is its new angular velocity? Let's take a look at the governing equations. The initial angular momentum has to be equal to the final angular momentum, and so we just go ahead and express that in terms of rotational inertia and angular velocity. We go ahead and take the mass times the radius squared to get our rotational inertia, and then this expression gives us the angular velocity in terms of radians per second. The right-hand side of the equation represents our final angular momentum. We have this expression for the rotational inertia. It has changed. We're going to be using a radius of 1 meter instead of 2 meters. And then we're going to rearrange this equation to solve for the final angular velocity, which turns out to be 16 pi radians per second compared to the initial angular velocity, which was 4 pi radians per second. Note that the angular velocity is inversely proportional to the square of the radius. We cut the radius in half and we quadrupled the angular velocity.
Let's look at how we can use conservation of angular momentum in analyzing collisions. We learned before in a previous unit that linear momentum is conserved in the absence of a net external force. Well, angular momentum is also conserved in collisions in the absence of a net external torque. And of course, we also learned earlier that kinetic energy is conserved if it's an elastic collision. Let's take a look at a collision here. We have a two kilogram blob of clay that travels at three meters per second in a straight line when it collides with the end of a uniform rod that is free to rotate. So here's the picture of our scenario. The blob moving towards the rod hits the end of the rod, which is free to rotate about its center of mass. Here's the particulars about the mass and length of the rod as well as the mass and velocity of the blob. There's no net external torque acting during this collision, so the final angular momentum is equal to the initial angular momentum. First, we want to go ahead and calculate our initial angular momentum. Here is the calculation for the blob. Notice we do not need to include the rod because the rod is stationary. It has no angular momentum before the collision. The initial angular momentum of the system is 0.15 kilogram meters squared per second. Next, we want to set up our expression for the final angular momentum. And in brackets, we have our expressions for the rotational inertia. This is the expression for the rod, and this is the expression for the blob, which is acting as a point mass. And we're going to multiply that by the angular velocity. So we go ahead and plug in our numbers rearrange the equation to solve for omega and we find out that after the collision the rod and blob of clay are rotating at 9 radians per second. Let's do a more conceptual and general analysis of collisions but we're going to look at a specific problem. A hockey puck travels with constant velocity on frictionless ice when it collides with a hockey stick laying on the ice. What happens to the linear momentum, angular momentum, and kinetic energy for the system? Well if we look at linear momentum we know that there are no net external forces acting on either of the puck or the hockey stick, so linear momentum is conserved in this collision. That gives us our governing equation that tells us that the initial momentum of the system has to be equal to the final momentum of the system. And in this problem, the velocity initially of the hockey stick is going to be zero, so this will go away. But I put it in there so we can see, in a general sense, our governing equation. Next, with angular momentum, since there's no net external force, there can be no net external torque. So angular momentum is conserved. And now this gets a little more lengthy, but this is the expression for the initial angular momentum of the hockey puck. This is the expression for the initial angular momentum of the hockey stick. In this problem, since the stick was lying motionless, this would be zero. And then these are the final uh, angular momentum for the puck and the stick. And lastly, with kinetic energy, we don't know, because this doesn't say if it's an elastic collision, so we don't know if kinetic energy is conserved. But the conservation of angular momentum gives us another governing equation to help solve collision problems. Well, this wraps up what we need to learn. Let's go back and summarize what we've learned. First, angular momentum is a cross product of the particle's position and linear momentum vectors. Its magnitude is equal to the mass times the velocity times the distance from the origin times the sine of phi, where phi is the angle between the position vector and the momentum vector. Its direction, that is the direction of angular momentum, is perpendicular to the position momentum plane as determined by the right-hand rule. A particle does not have to rotate to have angular momentum. For rotating particles and rotating rigid bodies, the angular momentum is equal to the rotational inertia times the angular velocity. And finally, angular momentum is conserved in the absence of a net torque. I hope you found this information helpful, and have a good day.